Um, we This is going to be a bit short and shit chat because we seem to have had initially the same glitch we had last week um, and I wasn't on when we thought I should be and Graham's just checking. Anyway, as you know, this is July the 26th, 2020 and quite a significant date. Um, but I think I'm just waiting again to see if Graham's checking from my phone to see if we have gone live. If not, we are in trouble. I might explain the significance of the date before I do Young at Heart. Um, we're on. So it's now four seconds past 11 and I will hand over to Graham, who you were expecting to see at this stage. Okay, apologies. IT is keeping us on our toes. Well, welcome once again to Blackburn Presbyterian Church. Whether you're watching live, and we hope we are live at the moment uh, on Facebook, uh, or later, which is the amazing thing about the internet, it's great to have you joining us, uh, and uh, I'm pleased to be able to invite you to worship uh, God with us this morning. Uh, we've been streaming each Sunday since the 22nd of March, and Melbourne's in lockdown again, but you can find our services uh, either on the church Facebook page, uh, as, as we are at the moment, or perhaps you've come across us later on the church website, blackburnpc.org.au. From the website, you can also download a PDF of our weekly leaflet, and uh, it has notes on the sermon uh, for those who want to access the uh, them that way, uh, but uh, we hope that you will uh, join us week by week. We're going to begin our service with, uh, with prayer, so let us unite our hearts in prayer. Almighty God, we are astonished that the whole world can be affected by a thing as small as a virus so cha challenging to our way of life and to our livelihoods and to our lives themselves. And we pray that you will help us at this time to take stock of what our lives are. We know we're passing through, uh, like it was written in Bob Dylan's song years ago. And we pray that you will speak to us in this part of our journey. Help us to join with you. Help us to hear your word to us. Help us to love and worship you for the love you have shown in Jesus. And draw near to us now. In this time we pray for his name's sake. Amen. Now I'm happy to say that Amanda's back with us. I seem to have left my remote somewhere. And uh, she's going to play for us Dolce uh, from Fantasia and E-flat by Telemann. So I think you'll enjoy this. It's a very beautiful piece of music. And thank you, Amanda for playing it for us.
Well, we think and hope that we've overcome the technical glitches. Um, and Graham said that Amanda is with us. Well, thank you, Amanda, for playing so beautifully and recording it because everyone, for everyone else, Amanda's actually not allowed to come into the church with us because of the lockdown. And we're really missing that because it was so good to have her with us and um, sometimes to play and Suzanne to read, just having someone else from the congregation with us. But it's worth it if we can get on top of this horrid virus. Now, I mentioned, or Graham mentioned the date, and I thought I would just say two significant things about today's date before I talk specifically to the young at heart. Well, I'm talking to them anyway. 48 years ago today, um, I cannot remember the exact time, but I think it was early morning, Graham and I and eight-month-old Andrew landed in Tullamarine. I'm not sure what it was called then, but it was fairly new, I think, location for international flights into Melbourne. So that was my very first day in Australia. The other thing about July the 26th is when we were out of the first lockdown, we sought medical advice about when we could realistically and healthily think about meeting together here. The advice we were given was not before the end of July, possibly the beginning of August. So we'd had today in mind as a possible opening date because we'd be well and truly back from Bondi, be able to rearrange the seats socially distanced. Anyway, it was not to be. So um, I'm now going to do my young at heart talk. And thank you. This is a new thing for me. I have never had any desire to stand up and speak in church. And I'll see how I go once the seats are filled again with people I love dearly. Um, but several of you have told me how much my talks have bent in very different ways to all of you, some of them making people remember <coughs> lovely kite flying times in their lights or going along a road with no headlights on their dad's car and so on. So I know that today's will mean a lot to all you keen gardeners out there. Um, one of the days we were in Bondi, that we really only had two very sunny days. One was the Sunday before our family returned from Bondi. The other was actually driving home. So we decided to visit the Botanic Gardens. And as you can see from this photo, um, with the Sydney Harbour Bridge in the background, Sydney Botanics have the most amazing location beside the harbour. We tried to get some colourful photos, not that I was planning this talk at the time, but there wasn't a lot of colour, but Graham did take one, um, and I cannot even remember what flowers they are, nor can Graham, we're not great with our flower names. Anyway, I come from a family who have always loved gardening, in some cases vegetables, in some cases flowers, in some cases both. My parents both grew up in, on crofts, my father on the Isle of Skye, my father in Alford, a uh, little, t well, three miles out of Alford in Aberdeenshire on a croft. So, of course, in, those ca in both their families, vegetable growing wasn't a fun thing to do. It was an essential thing to do in those months when you could grow vegetables when the ground wasn't frozen over. Two of my uncles, my father's brothers, became head gardeners on large estates in Long Island, on Long Island, in, in US, of course, my American cousins and their children, from what I see on Facebook and have seen myself when I've had the privilege to visit them, have been very and still are very successful gardeners. As a child in Glasgow, I grew up in a tenement flat, but my father rented what we called a plot or an allotment, which is a garden. I'm not sure of the size. I should have asked my sister 
It was about a 20 minute walk from our flat. And of course, nobody thought anything of walking 20 minutes in those days. Though when I look back in the summer, dad came home with some very heavy loads of vegetables, which we enjoyed and many of our neighbors enjoyed. Once we came to Australia, I initially focused on growing vegetables because that was what I knew best from the plot. But once I went back to work full time, that was after our youngest child went to school, there didn't seem to be so much time for gardening. So mainly it was a few herbs and some flowers. Since we've moved into our own place, we've both been rediscovering the joy of gardening. And somehow, I think in lockdown, all of us have been enjoying our gardens more than ever. I know that my sister and I have, and other relatives and friends have had discussions about how grateful we are that we have gardens and don't live in a flat with no garden to look out to or go into. My sister, I must say, is a much more productive gardener than I am, both in terms of vegetables and flowers. Anyway, to move back to our place and lockdown, these impatience, which have been growing at our back door, just outside our back door, which we use all the time, we hardly use our front door, They've been growing since 2018, December 2018. And I just felt that in lockdown, somehow, they just put on an even more colourful display, as if they were saying, cheer up. We had viola, but we don't have a photo on them, in the box outside our kitchen window. And both the viola and the impatience I found really heartening. The impatience are a bit tired. We didn't take a photo of them today. And the viola have died. But we have had as compensation the hardened bergia in our front garden, which we were encouraged to plant by our son's father-in-law. They have been more abundant by the day. So we have the purple ones on our east side and the white ones on our west side. The plan was, or my plan was, that after Bondi, after we got back from Bondi, and we're going to be around every day to look after them, we would go to one of our local nurseries and see what colorful annuals they had both for our back door plot or bed and our um, boxes. But of course, second wave came, lockdown came, and it didn't seem that wise to spend time browsing, even with masks. And also we weren't quite sure it was legal. Then I thought, I'll just try our local nurseries. I found one was willing to do an order and pick up service. So I told this lovely young lady called Grace at Acorn Nurseries, I might as well advertise them. I told her what I wanted for the window boxes. I just said, I'll leave it to you to choose something colorful. And she did. She chose these primrose and they seem to be taking very well and soon these boxes will be back on the fence outside the the kitchen window. Now the older among us, all of whom I know are still young at heart, will know at least one verse of a poem about gardens by Dorothy Frances Gurney. The kiss of the sun for pardon, the song of the birds for mirth. One is nearer God's heart in a garden than anywhere else on earth. And also the hymn by Cecil Francis Alexander. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, 
the Lord God made them all. Each little flower that opens, each little bird that sings, He made their glowing colours, he made their tiny wings. Of course, being nearer God's heart in a garden than anywhere else on earth is somewhat of an exaggeration. However, I do believe that enjoying cultivating beautiful plants and delicious vegetables gives us an opportunity to share in the bounty of God's creation It also links us with those we know or have known across the world and down through the generations who share this joy. And above all, I think it moves us to say, as God's people have been doing for generations, praise God from whom all blessings flow, praise him all creatures here below, praise him above ye heavenly host, Praise Father, Son and Holy Ghost. May God bless us all and our gardens. Thank you, Christine. That uh, poem about nearer, nearer God's heart in the garden always reminds me of Bella Houston Park. Most of you won't know where Bella Houston Park is, but it's in Glasgow and it has a beautiful walled garden. And above the arched entryway in the wall of the garden... There is that verse from that poem that Christine read. We're going to hear now from uh, the Bible, and Elise has uh, sent us uh, a, a film of her reading the Bible passage for today. It's Matthew 27, uh, the end of that chapter and the beginning of chapter 28. Thanks, Elise.
Thank you, Elise. Well, we're looking at the end of Matthew's Gospel. And uh, in the passage which Elise read, you heard the request for a guarded tomb, a guard on the tomb of Jesus. So Jesus died, and we know he died by crucifixion. And this morning, I want to pick on three things. Uh, I want to uh, talk about just briefly about the death of Jesus. Then I want to think about his burial. And then I want to draw your attention to his resurrection. You can see the image I've used uh, on the screen. It's of the uh, tomb of the unknown soldier at the uh, National Cemetery in Arlington uh, in uh, D.C. in the United States. It's amazing. Uh, the guard is uh, there every day of the year. It's changed regularly uh, in a most uh, dramatic and uh, solemn ceremony. And uh, I, I, it was the only sort of image of the guard of, to, of a to, guarded tomb that I felt I could use on the leaflet. There are so many uh, other imaginary ways of how Jesus' tomb might have been guarded, uh, but I didn't want to use them. And of course, this bears no real uh, similar, there's nothing similar about the purpose for this guard. It's really there to ensure solemnity and uh, decorum at our most uh, significant memorial in the US. But we know that Jesus died. And that's the first thing I want to draw your attention to. We know he died by crucifixion. In the middle of the word uh, excruciating, we've got the same word as the word crucifixion. In other words, the English word cru excruciating refers to intense pain. And crucifixion has given us this word because it is an, in an intensely painful and slow way to die. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ is by far the most renowned death by crucifixion. However, crucifixion was not rare. Rome crucified innumerable people. The suppression of the slaves in the Third Servile War, which was between 73 and 71 BC, in which a rebel slave and 6,000 of his followers were crucified, is well known. The event was memorialized in the 1960 Stanley Kubrick film, Spartacus, which I remember seeing as a teenager. The details of Jesus' death, that first Good Friday, are recorded with minor variants in all four Gospels. In fact, Jesus' death by crucifixion under Pontius Pilate is also referred to by Josephus, the Jewish historian, and by Tacitus, a Roman historian, who calls it the extreme penalty. Despite the details uh, varying in the Gospels, the church did not defer to those who wanted the accounts all combined and harmonized. I think that it's in itself is a worthy thing to think through, but it's important that each evangelist is preserved true to his own sources and for his own purpose. This is very important for careful study and understanding of our New Testament. Some people read the account of Jesus' death only at Easter. They think that's when you read about it. But I'm encouraging you to reread the story for yourself. Maybe try a different translation or listen to it being read. As you do this, I'm sure God will bring to your attention new insights. Matthew presents us with a day of drama the eerie darkness from noon till three in the afternoon, the piercing cry preserved in the Aramaic language, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthini, the tearing of the temple curtain and the earthquake with tombs broken open and souls raised, and finally the declaration from a Roman centurion, this was truly the Son of God. In the late 1960s, I heard a tape talk by Professor Norman Anderson he was professor of oriental law at the University of London. He was an expert in Arabic and had studied in the Middle East and written books about Islamic law. And he was director of the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies. And he expresses in that talk a similar astonishment to the centurion. He says, 
It is indeed the profoundest of mysteries that he should ever have died for us and for our salvation. Given what we know of the Gospels, we can understand why Peter would think that death would never happen to Jesus. He had been doing the most extraordinary things, especially healing people. And on occasions he raised the dead. Why would this person die? He seemed to transcend all the normal boundaries and people flocked to hear him te teaching. This one surely would not die. And yet Jesus' death is well documented in the text of Holy Scripture and in the annals of other historians. There's no doubt about it. Jesus died. But this is the, uh, an image of uh, Professor Norman Anderson, uh, and those are his words, a profoundest of mysteries that this one should have died for us and our salvation. But all of a sudden we get a new name in the narrative, a name we haven't heard before. You heard Elise read it. Joseph of Arimathea appears. Now all four Gospels again mention him. And again they have different emphases. For example, Matthew mentions that he was a rich man. And we discover that it was Joseph's own tomb which he relinquished and made available for Jesus. Luke mentions that Joseph hadn't consented to the decision of the Sanhedrin to execute Jesus. And additionally, John's Gospel tells us that when Nicodemus came, he, sorry, when, when Joseph came, he came with Nicodemus. John seems to have a particular interest in Nicodemus, uh, another member of the Sanhedrin. And together they brought uh, 30 kilograms of spices. They wanted to treat Jesus like a king. They wanted to ensure that he was royally entombed. And so we get different emphases as we gather the picture together about these two men who had not consented to the death of Jesus. And we get more insight into the Jewish leadership from these men as well. Not all members of the council consented to his death. And among the Pharisees there were those who, were de who had devotion to Jesus and wanted to serve him while they could. In recounting the burial of Jesus, all four evangelists make it clear Jesus was really dead. Roman execution squads knew their work. If they failed to carry out orders, they faced the possibility of forfeiting their own lives. Breaking the legs of a crucified person was something that could speed up death. And so also was lancing someone. And we know that both of these things happened to the three people who were crucified uh, on the day Jesus died. The two criminals had their legs broken to hasten their death, and Jesus was lanced. Nevertheless, the Sanhedrin leadership went to Pilate with the bizarre request to place a guard on Jesus' tomb. One of the Jesus movies, and I can't remember which one it is, uh, presents Pilate turning to one of his Roman associates and saying, what kind of people are these that want a guard on a tomb? He'd surely never before been asked for a guard to be put on the tomb of a dead man. The priests asked for a guard, motivated by the thought that Jesus' disciples might steal his body because they had heard a rumor that he'd talked about rising again. In fact, the Gospels are clear that on several occasions Jesus did talk about this. And it's quite possible that it was part of the intelligence they got from Judas when he betrayed uh, Jesus. So now dead and buried, what more might happen? Well, that brings us uh, past Joseph uh, and Nicodemus to the risen Christ. And I want you to uh, take a little time to think about this today. There's only one reason why the death of Jesus is the best known account of crucifixion in the whole of history. And that's because of the claim that Jesus rose from the dead. The early witnesses uh, testifying to this were responsible for changing the world, really. And Matthew's compact narrative points us to four things. 
the stunned guards. Uh, they were uh, uh, embarrassed to have to go and say to the priests who'd asked them to do this job that the disciples came, uh, the body was gone, and this, the priest said, T say the disciples came and stole his body. That's what we, and so that's the, that's the first alternative explanation that is given to the disappearance of Jesus' body. Say the disciples stole it. Uh, this was a risky lie for them to perpetrate, uh, but the chief priest said that they would defend the, the guards to the governors. They didn't want this, uh, the reality of the missing body to become known. And then a second thing, there was an angelic messenger. We heard Elise read about this. In fact, Luke tells us there were two, but Matthew is only concerned with the message of one who said that the significance of the open and empty grave was clear. Without his words, there would have been a missing body. But his words said, he's not here, he is risen. See the place where they laid him. Later on, I think it was in the uh, 19th century, a man called Venturini suggested the idea that he's not here, there's the place where they laid him. But Norman Anderson, in a, in a booklet which I'll refer to in a minute, says it's all very well, but it's, uh, you can't take the first and the last of what somebody says and then omit what he said in the middle, which is, he's not here, he is risen. Behold the place where they laid him. And this is emphatic in the text. It's repeated in verse 6 and 7 of uh, Matthew 28. And it's, he also says, you will see him. And that's repeated in verse 7 and verse 9. So all the Gospels mention that the women were the first to discover the empty tomb. And this is an unusual fact. Uh, it suggests the truthfulness of the event. The empty tomb is testimony to the risen Christ. There's a book called Who Moved the Stone? It uh, was written in 1930 uh, by someone who called himself Frank Morrison but was later discovered to be Albert Henry Ross who wrote under this name. And it's a very interesting book. Uh, and as of 2010, it has been reprinted 10 times and it's still in print today. In the process of exploring the evidence for the resurrection, Frank Morrison came to believe that the Lord was risen. His book had a profound impact on such literary figures as T.S. Eliot, G.K. Chesterton, and Dorothy Sayers, who in preparing her BBC radio plays, The Man Born to be King, delivered in wartime in 1943 over the BBC, uh, paid tribute to his research in this book. But there is more than this. Jesus has to be really and personally encountered. It wasn't just believing that he was risen from the dead, but the women actually encountered him and they were to see him and they were to have fellowship with him. I began to pay close attention to the evidence for the resurrection when I was a uni student doing engineering. And Sir Norman Anderson's talk about the evidence for the resurrection which I heard uh, and which I referred to earlier came in a context that I'm going to explain to you now. So this is a younger Sir Norman Anderson, and he says, it may indeed be objected by some, uh, some critic, that a resurrection from the dead is so incredible that no amount of evidence would suffice. Such an attitude seems prejudiced and unscientific, but let that pass. Let us assume that the resurrection of an ordinary man is indeed incredible. But such a line of reasoning cannot apply to the one whom we are considering. He was unique in all he did, in all he said, in all he was. Whichever way one looks at him, he is in a class by himself. Even apart uh, from the resurrection, there are excellent reasons and convincing reasons for believing that he was God manifest in the flesh. Is it then so incredible that such a one should rise from the dead? It would have been far more incredible if he had not. It is indeed the profoundest of mysteries that he would ever have died for us and for our salvation. 
But having died, it is no mystery that he should have risen. Now, in the case of Sir Norman Anderson, I'm referring to him because of uh, the impact he has had on my own thinking. But I, I heard this talk on a tape recorder in somebody's lounge room in the late, in the late 60s. But when I was a theological student a few years later, I heard him talk on BBC radio. He was an older man, and at uh, 5 to 8 every morning, the BBC had a five-minute reflection. And on this particular occasion, I didn't normally listen to this time slot, but on this particular day, I did. And Sir Norman Anderson uh, was talking there uh, about his son, Hugh. Now, Sir Norman Anderson had been a student at Cambridge. He, I discovered he got a triple first, which is pretty impressive. Uh, a first-class honours degree is an, a, is an amazing thing. To get a double first is totally impressive. And, uh, but I had never heard at that point of anybody getting a triple first, but he did. And he went as a missionary to the Middle East. And then the war came and he became an intelligence officer dealing with the Arabic world, the Arabic-speaking world, before coming back to be a lawyer in London and then becoming director of the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies at London University. And his son Hugh went to Cambridge, just like his dad had done. And Hugh was able as well. He was the president of the Cambridge Union, which is the uh, debating faculty, as a sense, the, the students' union debating organization. However, at the age of 21, Hugh developed cancer and died. And I thought ab about these words of uh, Sir Norman Anderson. The ultimate proof of the resurrection for each individual lies in one's own knowledge of the risen Christ for in this matter, the evidence of experience can supplement that of history. Happily, the promise of the risen Savior still stands. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to them and will eat with them and they with me. Sir Norman spoke of his son's hope in the resurrection and the evidence of a personal knowledge of Christ. And this is what we need. We don't need just to talk about it. We don't need to know data about it. We need to understand there are good reasons for it. But we need to go beyond that to a personal trust, to opening the door. On the other side of the wall behind me, there's a picture of Holman Hunt, uh, Christ knocking on the door of the heart. And the door needs to be opened. He doesn't batter it down. But he comes to you in your lifetime and knocks and says, Do I have a place in your life? Let me sup with you. Trust me. Travel with me. I am for you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we bow before you vulnerable to an unseen yet destructive enemy that has the potential to end our lives and conscious that people we know and love have a new and premature vulnerability. So reminded of our mortality, we thank you that the message of the Gospels ends not only with the death of Jesus for us, but with his resurrection. We thank you that Jesus, the Messiah, is risen from the dead. Comfort all who have lost loved ones in this pandemic, we pray, especially when they have been unable to be present to offer comfort and love at the hour of death. Help the bereaved find peace in the knowledge that you never leave or forsake your people. In these globally challenging times, when many have lost their jobs, income and sense of purpose, and some are suffering terrible hunger and deprivation. Fill us to overflowing with your love, a love that never fails, but always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Keep us from selfishness or greed. When resources are scarce, make us generous, cheerful givers, 
who show your love and practical care for those in need. We know the Lord will provide, but remind us each day that it may be through us that your provision will reach the needy. Again, we ask for your protection for frontline health care workers and all who maintain essential services. May our whole community embrace the challenge of caring for one another. May we have ears to hear what it means to be your family. In every country, we hear that it is the poor who suffer most in this pandemic. Grant genuine care to those who govern, that with wisdom they may protect impoverished families. Help us to participate with agencies that extend the reach of the wealthy nations to impoverished brothers and sisters. These things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour, who taught us to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Amanda is going to play for a couple more minutes, just while we quietly reflect on all that we've been thinking about. Thank you, Amanda. Let us pray. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon you and upon those whom you love, and all the people of God, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>